Okay. When you're dealing with a formal proof, there's a couple things or pieces that you'll start with. Okay. You will almost always be given an initial state and an end state that you're working toward. And so if I take just, again, a simple proof, let's say uh, 3x plus 1 is equal to 22, and we want to prove that x is equal to 7. And intuitively, you can go through and mentally calculate this and probably confirm that this works. Okay, but formally, in that, that structured proof format, you need to justify everything that you do. Okay, so when we look at this, our initial state is always our given information. Okay, our end state is also always our <coughs> conjecture. Okay, the word conjecture just means educated guess. Okay, and a conjecture will turn into a conclusion. when it is validated. Okay, so again, we see here that our end state is x equals 7. If we can confirm this using just a chain of logical arguments that each one justified by a specific reason that we've already established, then we can make the conclusion that x is indeed equal to 7. Okay, so the format of proofs that you're going to see will be two columns. One column will be for your statements and one column will be for the corresponding uh, <coughs> reasons. And, and when you write these, you're going to number them. Okay. You always begin with the, just by copying the initial state. So our first step in any proof is always just going to be to copy down the given information. The justification that we'll use will always be given. And you can just provide that it was, it was provided for us. That was the given information or the initial state. Okay, once you write this first down, now nobody should ever miss this. In, in all the years I've been teaching, one person has missed this on like a, a final. And so when you guys do your proof on the final, you should not be that second person that I can talk to in my class about. One person forgot or didn't put given. So it's kind of like a free point. Make sure you remember that. Every proof will always start with just the given information. All right, once you have the given information down, now you need to attempt to progress from the initial state to the end state. Okay? Now mathematically or algebraically, that should be easy for you guys because it's already pretty much ingrained to what you do, order of operations and and solving for x, you kind of do the reverse order of operations. So if we were looking here, as far as the justifications that we can use, here's what we have so far. Okay, so obviously we have given, I told you that. We have any definitions that we've established in class. We have any of the postulates that we talked about that are just assumed to be true. We have any of the axioms or common notions that we talked about that are assumed to be true. So this set right here basically comprise your first principles. And these are the things that are just accepted as true. And once we get through this set, you then can add any proven relationship. And we'll start simple when we get into geometric proofs. And, but for right now, all we have, since we're dealing with algebra here, we only have postulates, axioms, and that's really about it. <clears throat> so when we look at this statement, what's the next? In, and when you perform a proof, you have to justify every individual step by a separate reason. So what's one step we could take to make this statement closer to our end state of proving x is equal to 7? Now, I'm going to write it here, but you don't need to necessarily write these steps. You can just write the new statement that 3x is equal to 21. 
And what justifies this statement? What did we do between statement one and two to get this new statement? We subtract it. So we can call this subtraction property. And again, that's one of the axioms. If, hey, why is that an axiom rather than a postulate once again? Man. Good. It applies to any, any field of math, science, um, anything that would use calculations, so it would be considered an axiom. So subtraction property allows us to isolate the variable term. So we can move to our next step, which is to make what statement? X is equal to 7. And you get that statement because you performed what calculation? Division property. Okay, so again, you don't have to write anything. If you are doing this, you can write your steps to help you remember or identify what you're doing. And so this winds up being a simple three-step. You don't need to write the three here either. Oftentimes, if I give you a proof, if it's open-ended, I'll specify how many steps is the minimal number that you can use to, to complete it. But you're looking at a proof of uh, three steps here. Okay, so when you guys do these uh, algebraic proofs, this is basically what you're going to be uh, working toward. Okay, let me do one more example. Go through and see if you can complete the proof. All right, so when you're looking at this, step one is going to be what? It's always the given, right? You just rewrite your initial state. And we know that step, step four is going to be our end state, right? So again, even if, if it was something where you needed to identify it, you at least know, you might not know the reason yet, but you know your end state has to be identical to what was uh, asked for or uh, conjectured. Okay? Now, again, it's a conjecture until we prove it. Once we prove it, it becomes... Um, a conclusion, or in the case of relationships, it, they're called theorems. We'll talk about that as we get to them. But what would be the first mathematical step in solving for x here? Let's just shout it out. Yeah, I need to call. Add two to both sides, so we get five x is equal to thirty-five. Since we added, we uh, justify that statement as addition property. And then what can we do? Divide by 5, we get x is equal to 7. Once again, division property. And now, here's one of the properties that we talked about yesterday and that I said will come up in proofs because you need to make sure that your end state uh, is exactly as it appears. So even though we get the, the idea that x is equal to 7 in statement 3, it still doesn't mirror the end state completely, so you do have to make one final adjustment. And does anybody remember how you would justify that, Austin? Okay, so the reflexive one is that something's equal to itself. There's one more that says the mirror image, Brandon. Okay, so this one would be symmetric property. So here's the case where that would work. A reflexive property will usually be used when we start dealing with uh, segments and angles. Okay? And so it allows you to introduce a segment into a proof if there's no other specific relationships that you can use. Okay? All right, so by symmetric property, we can complete our proof, and we're done.